Hey everyone, welcome to uh, an episode of some random crap I'm putting together. I recently bought a new microphone, and I figured, hey, you know what? As much as I like playing games all the time and talking about the games and stuff, I kind of want to just occasionally wander back or wander off topic and just random stuff here and there. I mean, I love playing the games and I like doing all those let's play videos and all that stuff, but I'm always looking for new ways to sort of spice up the topics. So uh, spice up what I'm doing, add some new topics here and there. That's why I did like the first levels thing and the until I die thing and and the development diary for that game I'm putting together. But you know, I'm just uh, always looking for something more to do. So what I decided to do is just give this a try. Have just a sort of off-topic episode where I play a game that's roughly some way related to the kind of thing that I feel like babbling on about, and I just spend however much time I feel like just going on about it. Here I'm playing the game World of Warships, an online um, sort of team deathmatch or capture the flag kind of game. I, I did like a short uh, checkout video of this. But you pick a ship, you pick a class of ship, and then you get thrown into um, sort of like randomly assembled matchmaking teams and all that kind of stuff, and go and just duke it out with warships. All of this, all the ships and stuff in this game are between um, World War One and Two. So it's all like old school ship combat, the kind of thing that honestly never really happened a whole lot historically. People have this notion of, say, battleships. I'm using a New York class battleship right now. That battleships entered into service, fought a whole bunch of battles, came back, decorated up the ass with a bunch of different battle stars and stuff, sinking a whole bunch of enemy ships and all that. The reality is, large scale naval combat engagements didn't really happen all that often. I mean, you can really count on one hand the number of times oh we're gonna collide number of times that large-scale battleship on battleship combat actually occurred in real life I mean think like the Battle of Tsushima the, um, say um, Jutland stuff like that so battleships have a kind of um, distinction of being like the most unproven weapons ever to be used, actually used in war. Like, nowadays you probably think like atomic weaponry, uh, nuclear arsenals, that kind of thing, or sort of the ultimate unproven or unused weapons. But at the time, between the turn of the century into the 20th century from the 19th until uh, World War II, Large battleships and stuff were considered to be like the super weapons of the war of the world. If you had a battleship or a fleet of battleships, you were considered to be some uh, a world power, pretty much. And having large, lots and lots of battleships, strong, heavy battleships, were considered to be a sort of not only just a status symbol of your country, but also sort of a pretty good measure of your your nation's ability to protect itself in a fight or in a war or whatever. So lots of countries would oftentimes, like, regardless of whether it was actually a good idea or not, would actually try to build up large navies. Germany tried building up a large navy prior to World War I. And probably had actually the second most powerful navy in the world, but having the second most powerful navy in the world doesn't do you a whole lot of good when your enemy, Great Britain, had the most powerful oh, navy. Sold, so it was sort of like, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of good that's going to get you. And, of course, like, the, the result was the Battle of Jutland, which didn't really end that well for either side of that battle. But everybody, like, after the Battle of Tsushima during um, uh, the Russo-Japanese War... It was basically like, hey, these ships are big, they're expensive, and they're powerful, and if they get sunk, not only is it an enormous cost in human life, like some of these ships were so big they had like 1,500, 2,000 people on them, enormous cost in human life, but also 
a huge cost, financial rain, uh, cost, because these ships took several years to build. They cost a modern equivalent of like a billion dollars a piece to construct, and they didn't have, and they couldn't have that many of them because, I mean, you build one. Uh, okay, I did not fire that shell, but whatever. Well over, well over the mark. If you, um, if this ship ended up getting lost, then you were out like a pretty significant investment. Because, I mean, you couldn't build another one so quickly, and even if you could, the, uh, it, you, say you build two of these things today, five years from now, they're not, they're going to be kind of outdated. Ten years from now, you're going to wonder why you even bother to have this thing in your fleet anymore. They got outdated so quickly. Technology was advancing very quickly as far as uh, naval engineering was at the time. So, you had to be careful that you weren't wasting your money building these hugely expensive, hugely vulnerable in some ways. Oh, heavy hit there. Regardless of who gets the final kill, I'm the one that sunk that some bitch. <laughs> you couldn't just sort of, like, uh, build a fleet of battleships and expect them to survive forever. They got outdated. World War One era battleship had pretty much no business participating in a battle during World War II. Is that significant? A change. Pre-dreadnought battleships, which were... Uh, battleships which were, um, ah shit, I'm about to get blown up. Enemy cruiser destroyed. Yeah, I, at least I got the cruiser. A pre-dreadnought battleship, which is essentially a battleship built before, what, uh, 1910 I think it was? Where you had multiple different sizes of your main battery, your main weapons. Those things, by the time World War I came around, really had no business being yeah, being used in combat anymore because they were so outdated that, like, say, the Battle of Jutland, a pre-dreadnought battleship took a torpedo hit, just exploded. Why? Because it shouldn't have been there. It wasn't designed to defend against torpedoes. It wasn't... It didn't have an effective range. It was so slow. The difference between the main battery and intermediate battery, the two uh, sizes of the main guns, made it so it was difficult to determine which shot had actually made what splashed so it was harder to aim the guns during combat. All that kind of stuff. Five-year-old ship, ten-year-old ship, whatever. It didn't have any good reason to be there. Of course, that kind of thing doesn't really make any sense now. Say what the uh, USS Enterprise, uh, the uh, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, was just recently decommissioned. That thing was in service for 40 years or so. So it seems kind of crazy to say that kind of thing now, but back then, technology was advancing at such a rapid pace that a ship couldn't survive in service for very long without being relegated to, like, secondary duty or something like that. So let's you get things like... like the USS Arizona. The thing blew up during the attack on Pearl Harbor. I, I mean, it, obviously the Navy wouldn't have wanted all the sailors on board to die, and didn't want the ship to be lost from service, but honestly, like, by that point, the battleship had become so outdated, it was not really going to be terribly effective for anything other than, like, shelling land-based targets. That kind of thing. Then you have other things like... Say, the Bismarck is another popular example of a battleship that's sort of... Like, a big, powerful battleship, a little more defensively oriented and uh, offensively oriented, but the thing was a pretty significant threat, or at least was perceived to be one. But by then, the concept of that kind of ship had become outdated. Aircraft carriers, even the outdated planes used on the Ark Royal, the, the carrier that ended up damaging the Bismarck so it could be hunted down, they were, they were able to launch an effective attack on the Bismarck because the German Navy was unwilling or unable or simply un, uh, unable to recognize the change in combat techniques, so they relied on an old-school concept, the battleship, with 
mis, uh, mis implemented or designed guns for anti-aircraft, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it, things just outdated so quickly. Then you have the fact that, like, you had a small navy of battleships because you couldn't really afford to build a large navy of battleships. It just couldn't be done. So what do you do when when a war starts? You kind of want to shield the things from fight. You don't want to send all your battleships in to potentially get sunk because of loss of financial loss and loss of life and all that kind of stuff. So you didn't see much in the way of large-scale naval battleship on battleship combat. And even when you did, oftentimes the result was not this spectacular victory or defeat or anything like that. It would have been something like, um, like, uh, I don't know, smaller engagements where one ship took some damage and eventually retreated or something like that. Not, oh, we kicked their ass. I mean, like Tsushima being an obvious exception to that. A uh, huge victory for, for the Japanese. But, like, Jutland was a was a, one of very few examples of a large-scale battleship on battleship battle. And even with, like, loss of life and 10, 000, over 10,000 or so, multiple ships sunk, it was a not particularly... Um, it, wa it wasn't immediately even obvious who had won the fight because of the, like, who who was trying to do what, I mean, like, and, and even then, only a small percentage of the ships that participated in the battle sunk or took enough damage to be removed from service or anything like that. So it's like, we have this game simulating a kind of style of war that was really uncommon. Crap. Oh my god, look at all those torpedoes. Oh shit. Launch yours and then blow up, because, you know, <laughs> I was not going to survive that. Wow. The enemy team has taken the that lead. was a lot of torpedoes. Uh, I mean, I guess it's physically possible that that one torpedo could hit that cruiser out there as long as they're not paying attention. They're within range, I think. But, you know, no, I'm not going to hit them. And of course, the way it's represented in this game is sort of unrealistic as well. For example, like, a cruiser, honestly, should not be throwing itself forward into a battle, uh, fight against a battleship. A cruiser is smaller and lighter, lighter armament, lighter armor, but it's faster. The reason why they would build cruisers instead of battleships is, for one thing, they're easier to build and cheaper to build, and you can build more of them. But also because, hey, there's a battleship there. It wants to pick a fight with us. Hey, don't frickin' do it. Get out of there. That's the reason why you would have a cruiser. So you can get out of the way. Same concept with a battle cruiser. You don't want to be frickin' picking a fight with that. This game kind of um, plays around with that concept. But really, like, a battleship and a cruiser are worth the same amount of points and all that. And each one has its advantages and disadvantages. So in the event that you do take one up against the other. It's just a matter of who can play better rather than who has the more powerful ship. The, um... In reality, like, a, a cruiser would have a difficult time even damaging a battleship, anything more than, like, superficial damage to its superstructure. Damaging, like, um... the... below the waterline or on the waterline at the armor belt would be almost impossible for a contemporary cruiser contemporary to the battleship it's fighting. Also, um... Oh, they're heading to C. Maybe I should head to B. So pretty much, like, a cruiser would always want to just avoid a fight with a battleship unless it had some pretty significant backup. The concept of torpedo destroyer boats, or destroyer uh, like the destroyers that we see in this game, were a genuine threat to larger ships back in, say, World War I or so. I, I forget what it was. A British battleship, HMS something, something, I forget what. 
was sunk in the Mediterranean by, I think it was a, a small torpedo boat from the Ottoman Empire, went and just torpedoed that thing, sunk a big expensive battleship full of people. Small torpedo boat. I think barely had any offensive weaponry to speak of, but it had torpedoes and that was enough. That was, um, that was a pretty significant threat. But by World War II, torpedo boats, the threat that, and even World War I to some extent, the threat of torpedo boats had diminished quite significantly because of the implementation of torpedo boat destroyers. We call them destroyers now. Because, like, um, smaller, lighter craft, a, a smaller main battery, but far more than enough to take down a torpedo boat. Um, I should stick with high explosive rounds for now. But in this game, those um, destroyers are, like, the bullies of this game. I mean, they can't take much of a beating or anything like that, as they shouldn't be able to, as dest destroyers are generally unarmored. And their main battery is only really good for taking out other destroyers or aircraft carriers. But their torpedoes that they can launch are devastating in terms of the amount of damage they can do or the, what they can do to other ships. I mean, uh, historically it's not like an unfounded thing, but the game doesn't quite get the... doesn't quite get it right. Oh man, he got me good. Oh man, where did they go? The freaking concealment spec in this game is also kind of batshit crazy. I did it like this, buddy. Ha ha ha! Oh man, I am taking all of the hits here. <laughs> oh man, I am not gonna win here. I'm just getting my ass kicked one game after another. <laughs> At least I got a hit there. Oh, it's actually a pretty good hit. Of course, modern-day naval warfare is something that's completely different. Like, the United States, of course, maintains the most powerful navy. But it's sort of like questionable effectiveness and the... and the uh, goals of it are very different than uh, what it was, say, during World War I or II sort of, uh, either, it's like, what do you call it, um, I'm losing all my battles here, either like convoy raiding to sink enemy uh, transport ships, or say like interdiction, trying to intercept things on the way to a, another fight or anything like that. For the most part, uh, I mean, like ship-to-ship -ship combat isn't something that's taken a whole lot into account nowadays. In fact, for the most part, I think it's expected that nowadays, if there is going to be ship-to-ship -ship combat, it will probably end up being a submarine sinking a surface ship, or a submarine sinking another submarine. Aircraft carriers, which used to be, like, considered the king of ship-to-ship -ship combat during World War II, uh, I mean, they obviously uh, are capable of that kind of thing now, but uh, they're more based around the idea of striking surface targets. Basically, a, just a mobile airfield. The ships themselves are unarmored nowadays, so they wouldn't be able to take much of a hit before going down, and that actually kind of scares me a little bit, because larger aircraft carriers, the supercarriers nowadays, have a crew of several thousand. But, I mean, we've never actually lost a supercarrier, that's a good thing. Lost uh, plenty of fleet carriers back during World War II, but, you know, such as when facing a enemy navy that's roughly comparable. You see, um, distribution of forces in this game is a little bit weird. Here, I'm in a destroyer, and I'm, I'm going to try and sink a battleship to uh, get my point across what I was uh, talking before about destroyers being a little overpowered in this game. The... Um, you can pick as, like, there... I have an American destroyer here. There's probably a Japanese ship over there. No, I think it's American. But, I mean, there's a Japanese ship. That's a cruiser. Yeah. There are a lot of, like, uh, 
Speaking of battleships essentially being the super weapons of the day, and you could sort of think of the power of a sort of enemy navy or whatever being largely based on the number of battleships or the effectiveness of the battleships they're able to bring into a fight. Kind of like a, a weird thing. It triggered an arms race. Now, most people think of an arms race in terms of the nuclear arms race, the Cold War between the United States or the other uh, Western nations and the Soviet Union. It was definitely an example of an arms race, but it's not the only one. There an arms race that occurred back in the first quarter or the first half of the 20th century, depending on how you look at it, and it was the battleship arms race. After the... Uh, Ironclad warships had proven their efficacy during the American Civil War. Whereas large, like a ship of the line, huge ship, 70-some, 90-some guns, very effective in its day, weapon was essentially a sitting duck to a frigate, a small ironclad or iron-hulled iron ship that could just sort of go in there, take whatever damage you can throw at it, and then just start kicking ass. Nothing you can Smoke really do generation. about it. So it sort of changed the way uh, wars were going, but once it was discovered, like, okay, we can actually start building larger, larger ships. They don't have to be small, like the, uh, like the Monitor or the West Virginia or something. We can build these things pretty friggin' big. So then, the concept of the battleship was born. Yeah, thanks for that. Think you're gonna sink me with that shit? <laughs> There's a cruiser. I think I might have to settle for sinking a cruiser. Because I'm getting, uh... I'm getting wrecked here. <laughs> I'm not very good at this game while talking. I swear to you, I am actually better at this while playing it normally than I am right now. I hit that, uh, I hit that destroyer, that's crazy. I mean, that destroyer's on fire, so it might, it might explode at some point, or sink. Alright. The ship of the line, the huge super weapon of its day, was replaced by the smaller, ironclad warship, and that sort of changed the way warfare was fought at the time. Eventually, they discovered, hey, you know what, we can build these things bigger, we can build them better, and you started building things like armored cruisers and eventually battleships. And there was this arms race between the various uh, nations of the world, thinking, hey, we're sitting ducks if we don't have our own fleet of battleships. Now, the reality was that they very rarely engaged each other, so it took a long time for them to design the things really capable of effective combat. The USS Maine, really more of an armored cruiser than a battleship, which was sunk in Havana Harbor prior, uh, just prior to the Spanish-American War, that thing had some really weird design flaws to it. And the reason why is because the designers didn't really know what they were doing. They knew how to build a steel-hulled ship, and they knew how to build large guns, but they really didn't know how the thing would be used in combat. So it had weird design deficiencies. It was slow, it took too long to build. Really like a flawed ship from the beginning. But they felt like they had to build it because they were afraid of what other Western uh, Western nations would do if, like, they felt like they'd be sitting ducks to other Western nations who were building their own battleships. And of course, as technology improved and techniques improved, it better steel, better design techniques, better uh, better war doc uh, battle doctrines, all that kind of crap, changed the. Uh, change them to be much better and more advanced and all that kind of crap. Group three, ready for but everybody's always building these new ones up and the size of battleships really started to explode around World War One or just before. The HMS Dreadnought was like a 15,000 long ton displacement ship. Big for its day, but not enormous. But within... Um, 
But within a few years, they started building what they called super dreadnoughts, which were ones which were much larger, like another 10,000 tons. These things were huge. So huge that the HMS Dreadnought itself actually became was considered to be an obsolete weapon not terribly long after it was produced, like, because the displacement of all these other ships... What? From what? Oh. ...began to uh, balloon up in size so quickly. So everybody was, like, always constantly trying to iterate on their designs, make them better, stronger, faster, blah, blah, blah. And that is kind of a problem, because, well, all these different nations trying their darndest to, um, trying their darndest to outbuild each other, tends to have this sort of runaway, uh, oh, shit, that's, that's a bad angle. Oh, jeez, this is going to be difficult. Launch on this ship. Now get the hell out of there. Okay, I'm gonna get it with at least two hits. Hopefully three. That's nah, gonna be two. A good two. Up, 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 up. Oh, that was close. Get the hell out of there then. You can't do anything against a ship. That's a torpedo bummer. The, um,. Uh, I better change my direction of my aircraft carrier. The So you have these different all these different nations trying to build larger and larger ships. It got out of hand. So eventually after uh, World War I had been fought, they realized, crap, this is ballooning out of control. And specific Western nations like Great uh, the British Empire, which was in the process of collapsing, they couldn't really afford to maintain their the enormous navy that they'd always been trying to maintain since like the Battle of Trafalgar they had had the most powerful navy in the world and they wanted to maintain that but they couldn't. British simply didn't have the resources, the, the money, the steel, the whatever to maintain building a larger and larger navy all the time plus certain like design concepts that they had always been trying to do like speed over firepower, firepower over armor, all that kind of crap had sort of shown its weaknesses during certain uh, engagements, notably the Battle of Jutland during uh, World War I. So they had a navy which was potentially ineffective. Potentially ineffective navy and a... Where's my... Uh, my... Okay, they had landed. Potentially ineffective navy in a world where the United States Navy was growing larger, the Japanese Navy was growing larger, the German Navy had very nearly proven itself to be powerful, uh, quite a significant enemy, was potentially a problem as well, even though they had uh, their Navy had been pretty much destroyed by the end of uh, World War One, Not through battle, but through, like, scuttling and crap. So then you have, like... Um, the American Navy was kind of... The Americans were kind of afraid of other nations, too, and they wanted to avoid a large arms buildup. Especially, like, from Japan, who was very much um, prepared to continue that arms race, that buildup, because they were doing a pretty good job of building their own ships after they had basically taken designs from other countries and implemented them in their own way and made them... Uh, added their own enhancements and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to be able to torpedo that thing from this angle. Unless it crashes into the land there. Group three, we are under attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get over here. If you can't... Um, if you can't build a superior navy, then you have to go and prevent others from doing it. So that's what the idea behind the Naval Limitations Treaties following World War I were about. I'm actually going to get impacts on two ships. Got that one. Oh, no, that didn't hit. I'll go speed up. Get my ship out of the line of fire. 
Oh, okay. Okay, I hit that battleship there pretty good. But, um... Problem solved, sir! I mean, I had fighter escort and they didn't take down those... So the Naval Limitation Treaties following World War I went and reduced, like, the total... Reduced the total uh, size of every nation's um, battleship fleet by tonnage, not by ships total, I think. Oh, nice torpedo impacts you had there, buddy. So then you get... Uh, so, I mean, it probably worked out better for the U.S. and Britain than it did for Japan. And certain countries were hit harder by them by than others. Like, for example, Germany was actually hit, was smacked pretty hard by these naval limitation treaties. I think they were limited to building ships only of about 15,000 long tons, which is, I mean, is maybe a dreadnought-sized battleship. But by that point, as really more of a cruiser than a battleship. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to prevent Germany from really going and just going hog wild with their designs. Because they were doing pretty freaking good. Compare, like, the HMS, um, HMS Queen Mary, which exploded in a big explosion from a shell impact. What did I... What did I sink? <laughs> Probably a ship that had caught fire when I torpedoed it. Um, the HMS Queen Mary, which was exploded during the Battle of Jutland, a British battleship. To, say, the Ludzow, a British battleship that... Um, caused a f and destroyed air damage caused by flooding sea 40%. Uh, it's because they weren't paying attention. Or even playing. Compare that to the Ludzow, a ship that fought in the same battle, didn't sink, but sank as a result of being, like, seriously bombarded over an extended period of time. And it didn't explode, it just sort of sank and was abandoned, because they were afraid they, they weren't going to be able to make an escape with that thing in tow. So the, the German designs, I would dare say, were superior to British. So the British, or the Germans were, like, smacked the hardest by these design, uh, a limitation treaties and restrictions. Eventually, I think the what was it the the um, Germans managed to negotiate a kind of better treaty for themselves through. Uh, uh, I think they could build up to like a thirty thousand long ton ship. But even then, that was fairly light. I think the, uh, what was it, the South Dakota class in the United States was maybe 35,000 tons. And the Iowa class was eventually, uh, what, 45,000 tons. Of course, that's all dwarfed by the Yamato, which was maybe uh, 50 or 55 or so. So the, the Germans were pretty well constrained in an attempt to limit the naval arms race which was occurring, which wasn't really... I mean, building these large ships constrained industry, it constrained... Uh, constrained industry, it constrained economics. It's an expensive thing to do. You can't just keep building battleships all hog wild. So, what do they do? They smack everything down. They try to, to slow down the explosive, like increase in size of these things. Germans, this was the the Nazis were coming into power, all that kind of stuff. They felt the need, historically like they did during World War I, to have a large, powerful battle fleet. So that's what they tried to do. They tried to build a huge battle... Uh, they wanted to build a huge battle fleet, so that's why they started building newer battleships like the Bismarck, which, I mean, even with the reduced naval treaty that they were subject to, was still oversized. I mean, it was bigger than they were permitted to build by treaty. Ooh, that could be a nice impact. Oh, no. I missed a cruiser, but I did get the aircraft carrier.
bombers. Sink those bombers. Come on. The Bismarck was large. I think that, assuming it was a 35,000 ton limitation, it still exceeded that. I think the Bismarck was maybe like a, somewhere between 40 and 45,000 tons. Slightly smaller than like an Iowa class battleship. It's also fast, pretty well constructed ship, but more defensively oriented, like the Ludzow was. Even though the Ludzow was actually a battle cruiser, which is kind of weird to think of it that way. More defensively oriented than uh, like a British counterpart would have been. Don't go over there, you're going to get destroyed by all that flak. It's going to land anyway. <laughs> the. Um, of course, like I was saying before, the Bismarck and the Turpins, its two, sister ship, were... Two, then get the fuck out of there. <laughs> Here, there's someone you can destroy. You had to, I mean, just take into account the, the fact that even though it was a powerful ship and potentially very useful ship, it was out of date. But even then, like... Um, the Germans lied about what it was, tried claiming it was a smaller ship, and even then, when they were still under limitations, unable to build large ships like the Bismarck by treaty-wise, they still did other things in an attempt to sort of abide by the rules, but um, but not uh, like still take advantage of the wiggle room that it granted them. Wow, we're perfectly tied right now. The, like, they started building things that were often called pocket battleships, which were essentially cruisers that were designed, like, very well, basically built more like they were battleships, but cruisers, smaller ships. And it was sort of Germany's way of wiggling around the restrictions that they had. I would say that, I mean, it, it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's really underhanded. I mean, they did sort of follow the letter of the treaty, I think. But, uh, you know... It wasn't the idea behind it. Oh, where, where is my fighter squadron? Oh, there it is. Okay, we got two BBs up there, two cruisers. Oh, there's a cruiser down there, and two aircraft carriers. One carrier's damage to my torpedo strikes. Damn it! I hate all this damn flak. Is that, tar is that bomber going to try and do anything, or is this going to dick around? That battleship over there better get its ass over here and into the fight. If either of those squadrons make a run for it, I'm going to take them out. But they're afraid. They're afraid to head away from their their um, their carriers because the carriers are providing screen defense, uh, anti-aircraft fire in order to. Okay, that one carrier should be easier to hit, but this one here is damaged. Oh, damn, I lost it. Hopefully we can, by a combination of our torpedo firepower, destroy this one. Ah, only one impact. Well, maybe I might get a second impact back here on that carrier. Well, do something about it. Oh, two impacts. I'm sinking that carrier. Gotta love it. Boom. Okay, back off from their flak. They're not making any moves, and we've taken the lead. Pretty commanding lead, if I do say so myself. Not that that was, like, solely my doing. <laughs> In fact, the, um, most of the damage on that carrier was... Oh, shit, they're, they're sneaking their ships across the top. Got a cruiser over here, but that's not going to be enough to take out two battleships, even if you're not paying attention very much. K-1 
Carriers are worth 90 points. Battleships and everything else are only worth 60. So sinking the carrier should be a priority. But they don't. But as long as I can keep them at bay using my fighters here, uh, they might do some damage to that destroyer. At least I'll have an opportunity to maybe sink, head, destroy those. Screen that damn guy. I'm sick of digging around with this. We got plenty of time to finish this battle, but everybody has to get more aggressive. Fortunately, uh, carriers have an unfortunate problem of not being able to do damage at a high high rate. You know. Get your asses out here! There, take them out! Take them out! Bombers! Gotcha. Oh, they took out our destroyer. But get those get those bombers. I'm sick of them. I mean, they don't have any fighters, so I don't really have to worry about anybody taking out my my uh, torpedo bombers. But still, I mean, I don't want... Group 2 was destroyed. True. Well, the replacements are in the air. It's only two fighters, though, so it's a small squadron. Rather than nothing... I should take out that battleship. But they're riding the damn wall. Oh, God. I hate, I hate it when they ride the wall. Because it makes it... Torpedo bombers, at least last time I played, torpedo bombers can't hit someone riding the wall because their aim goes way off. Yeah, see, this person's going on about it, too. Riding the frickin' wall. I hate it. It's practically cheating. I mean, they need the... They gotta patch that crap out. Uh, I think that carrier was up here somewhere. Ah, oh, there it is. I'm going to sink that carrier. I got That bitch is mine. Once I get a... Once I get a good angle on it. There we go. That should be good. <sighs> Lost one. <sighs> that should do it. Yeah, I gotcha. I got you, baby. Haha, <laughs> just a cruiser left. Yes, I did. Now that one I will take good credit for. It. Damn it. Get him. Somebody get up there and attack him. What are you doing back here? Get your ass up there and attack him. And you, your aim sucks. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Your aim sucks. It's only 20 seconds left. I don't have enough time to launch another attack. Oh, damn it. We're definitely not going to win by points now. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, well. It's a pretty good match. Saw one to the end, at least, this time. Oh, we did win. And I got a reasonable number of points out of that match. Three destroyed. Um, one of them's a liquidator. Eleven hits on torpedoes. Twenty-three planes shot down. One incapacitation. Five floodings. And uh, destroying eight aircraft in one battle. Hmm. If it had gone on, we probably would have won, but... Would have been maybe a difficult, uh... Hmm. I don't want to invest in this, because I don't want to get rid of my fighter squadron for the sake of a bomber squadron.
Submarines are a thing that's not in this game. Although I'm hearing some rumors and some talk out of the developers that they're considering doing it. It would kind of imbalance the game. It'd be kind of boring, though. Submarines are were a very feared thing back during World War I and II. And they're very good reason to. They could hide, launch torpedoes, and sort of like skulk away. No one would see them. The reality was that of all of the combat units, especially in like, I think, especially in the German side of World War One and Two, but even like in the Americans and the uh, Japanese and stuff subs, Action station. submarine duty had actually like the highest mortality rate, the, the attrition rate for, especially like German subs. Like if you, if you serve, if you border the sub in the beginning of the war and you served on subs uh, throughout the war, you had like an 80% chance of dying or something like that. It was like a ridiculous, ridiculously high attrition rate of these guys. And a lot of that has to do with the um, limitations on design and technology and stuff at the time. Submarines, very difficult thing to build. And like with battleships, I had to put a lot of effort, a lot of time and trial and error into building the things and designing the things. The H.L. Huntley, the first... A submarine to sink another ship in combat, for example, was a horrifically badly designed, this horrible piece of shit that shouldn't have been put in the service and actually killed more of its own crew than it ever managed to. Like, it killed its own crew twice over, including its creator. Then when it was pressed in the service to sink the USS Housatonic, it went and, yeah, it destroyed the ship and killed, like, six people on the ship, but also ended up with the death of, like, the 10 or 15 or so people that were on board it. So, I mean, crudely designed piece of garbage. But it's a process building these things. Of course, it wasn't the first military sub. It was just the first military one to sink a ship. And looking at some of, like, um, the early U.S. subs that followed that, United States Navy subs, they were horrifying-looking things. World War One, you started to see like the proliferation of potentially like practical sub designs, which should actually go out there, operate semi-independently, sink ships stealthily, and all that kind of stuff. But even then, they weren't terribly well designed by today's standards. Today's submarines are incredibly well engineered. You can almost say over-engineered because they're fr ridiculously expensive and all that. But they, they managed to build things which are quite uh, impressive for their day. Unfortunately, it wasn't impressive enough, and a lot of submarines were either sunk in combat or just disappeared into the ocean and just never found out what happened to them. may have been sunk by enemy fire and it was never recorded, or it was recorded by a ship that later sank so no one was alive, can't gain credit for the kill or whatever. But submarine duty was very dangerous. I mean, it was really all that the Germans could really do during World War I and II in order to at least try to put up some sort of a fight against the um, merchant trade and reinforcements coming to Britain from Canada and the United States eventually. But, uh, I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't like the super effective, like, murder-y-all, end-all-be-all weapon that it was often thought of as. <sighs> He's moving. It's going to be hard to get him. That's what I'm going to do. Ah, damn you. Ah, stop. Dodging, you little bastard. <laughs> Hard for me to hit. Destroyers are a little too difficult to attack in this game. He doesn't look like he's moving very much. I'm not going to be able to fire more than one shot from this position. Because i got to dodge the, uh, the land up there. 
still, it's kind of like a, the submarines of World War II especially were, were definitely on the right track towards designing better ships. Now, if you look at... Um, I tend to... I mean, I'm not entirely sure how factual this statement is. But I tend to look at it like this. You had the three countries that were building the most submarines and trying to get the most out of their submarine fleets. Germany, obviously, with their U-boats, doing to sea boot. The, uh, Japan and the United States. Now, obviously, the German ones are the most famous because of the um, because of the U-boat threat and the Battle of the Atlantic and all that crap. But it's um, the United States actually had some pretty good submarines, so the, and they had the United States had the best targeting equipment for their torpedoes. They were just sort of hampered. The United States Navy was hampered by the fact that the torpedoes themselves were sort of poorly designed and flawed. That kind of, uh, it was kind of a bad design, multiple errors and stuff. So, the United States had good subs, excellent targeting equipment, bad, um, bad torpedoes. So that kind of limited their effectiveness. Now, um, Germany had the best submarines. They had some crazy good sub designs. I don't know about their targeting or sub uh, or torpedoes, but um, can't have it all, I guess. Okay, armor-piercing rounds for you, buddy. Ah, damn it! Okay, that was fired a little high. Gotcha! Hit the Citadel. And that's what happened during the Battle of Jutland. These battle cruisers were lightly armored, were hit by armor-piercing rounds, in a fight they never should have even been a part of. But they were because, I mean, you look at it, it looks like a battleship, so they're going to get used like a battleship. So, an armor-piercing round goes and pierces the powder magazine. Same thing happened to the USS Hood. Okay, he's changing position. This is a bad place to fire from. Plunging shot. Oh, got him again. I am wrecking this fleet. Who else wants some? I will fuck you all up. This cruiser is a little more of an, a reasonable range. I'm going to target him. This is what happens when a lightly armored ship goes up against something with more powerful uh, armor-piercing weapons and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I think I'm going to hit him with that. Oh, no, he changed position. Damn cruisers are so maneuverable. Ride cover for who? Attention, reporting the target position. Not him. All forces, capture that area. Hopefully I can get out of fire a little bit so I can start uh, repairing my ship a little bit. Oh crap, that was way off. <laughs> Gotta aim a little better. Oh, oh, they collided. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Oh, another hit the Citadel. I'm doing crazy good damage in this this match. I'm just going to swing around and see if I can do a little bit more bullying to these cruisers. I want lots of points because I want to upgrade to the next class battleship. Uh, where are they? That's not the one I hit, but... I'll, uh... I, uh I'm gonna miss. Oh, <laughs> hit the damn mountain anyway. Alright. They're trying to capture. They're actually gonna win this fight, I think. But I've gotten plenty of, uh... I've gotten plenty of kills in, so at least I'll get some points for the fight. Not as much as I would want. But I'll do my best to try and take this, uh, these two out. Maybe if I get lucky, I'll score some good hits and give us a fighting chance. Oh, I was leading too far. Uh, no, no, not that bad. Got a nice hit the Citadel. I am just 
getting perfect shots in left and right. Oh, nope, nope. He got a good shot on me, too. I am done. I mean, I'm going to get a chance to fire next, but... But still, uh, somebody else is firing at me. Another battleship. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll sink this guy. Then I can... Um, And it was another good shot, but not nearly as good as the last one. Did some good damage, though. Sunk two ships, four hits to Citadel. Only 17 shell hits for that much damage. Not that I'm actually that good. I'm just lucky. I don't have to actually watch a battle play out to get the points for it. Hmm. I'm going to pick the Omaha again. Japanese had the best torpedoes, just going back to that. They had tremendously effective long-range torpedoes. The um, So, it's kind of like... I mean, the Germans and the Japanese never really fought each other. And submarines at the time weren't really used for anti-submarine warfare the way they would be now. Submarines didn't really attack submarines because the subs didn't... The torpedoes didn't really, like, target the way that they do now. Like, how are you going to know where the sub is exactly? Battle starts. Nowadays, it's different. <coughs> wow, this is a small battle. What happened here? Well, there should be a fault line domination. Should be a... Should be a uh, shorter fight. It's a shame, uh, we got our asses, we were going to get our asses kicked in that last round, because they moved up the capture, the, f the capture point, the reason why they're going to win. I mean, I got some pretty good hits in there. Cruiser play, I have to say, is probably the, the most fun you'd get out of this game, because they combine the best balance of speed and artillery. And even, like, some cases, torpedo attacks, like this cruiser does, the Omaha class does, and a number of Japanese cruisers have, have, uh, good, uh, torpedo attacks and stuff, unlike a lot of destroyers usually rely on for that kind of thing. Although, honestly, I wouldn't rely as much on torpedo attacks with this thing as I would with a destroyer, because... I mean, look at this. I fire out. It's only three torpedoes as opposed to six per side that you'd see out of a destroyer of this level. They want to stick together? I'm going to do it, but they better move their asses up. Playing pure defense in this kind of game is terrible. Oh, there's a battleship. It's well out of my range. I'm a little worried and I might not be out of its range. Uh, that'd be a lucky shot if I hit that destroyer. I had to get the shot off as quickly as I could. Oh, I did hit it. Sweet. Not a terribly good hit. Oh, no. I had an incapacitation. That means I took a... Uh, I took something they had offline. A, like a... a main battery or torpedoes or something. Hopefully I can get another shot off at it. Oh, where'd it go? Ah, smoke field deployed. So I can't, uh, I won't be able to see it. I'm out of range of those. Range for this ship is only a little, little short of ten and a half kilometers. Or for, for a little short of fifteen kilometers, that was seconds. Don't move, I'm dodging out of your way. Don't do the other way around. I'm not playing chicken here. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna loop around to the to the port. Um, yeah, I'm well out of range. I got a I got one lucky shot, and then I've retreated from battle. I think my destroyer that I wrecked is over there. 
They got one extra destroyer than we do. We have one extra cruiser than they do. Oh, they're going to try and sneak up on the side. Oh, that destroyer is going to try and torpedo that cruiser down there. I mean, it's out of my range. I can't do dick about it right now. Nope, nope, nope. Didn't work. Our cruiser, uh, cruiser won. It is hard to torpedo a cruiser, because they're maneuverable enough to make such an attempt difficult. They're out of the range of my torpedoes. I could fire them, but it'd be kind of pointless. See, this kind of strategy doesn't really work for me, because I don't have the range to engage these guys at full, uh, at the distance that everybody else is. I need to get closer, or else I'm just going to be screwing around. I'm going to use high explosive rounds for now, because armor-piercing rounds at this range in this game don't really work that well, and uh, high explosives can set the ship on fire like I have, and I'm doing damage here, and that's good. Okay, there, uh, oh, there's a destroyer. I want that thing dead. And do I have him? I got him, but not well enough to sink him. That was a kind of a wide spread. Looks like they're moving all of their ships over to try and attack from the west side. So I am going to sneak around. I want to get to the. I wanted to be on the left side of this island. Damn torpedoes. I think I am going to... Nope, 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 nope. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Shit, 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 shit. Oh, okay. We're all below the water Sons of bitches. Quickly. Show you, you sacks of shit. Show you something exploding. You! <laughs> ah, damn it. That torpedo, that got, that's what got me. I'm doing this for over an hour. Wow. That means that this video may never see the light of day. One more fight. Pick up as a destroyer. It's my fault. I should have done more to dodge that torpedo attack. Come on now. Come on. Oh, my coffee's gone cold. Got it an hour ago, no wonder. Destroyers are exceptionally good at attacking aircraft carriers because Aircraft carriers are very bad at defending against destroyers. The torpedo bombers are unlikely to get a hit on them because they're way too maneuverable. You can dodge out of the way of torpedo attacks. And bombers are, in this game, surprisingly ineffective, unable to even launch an effective attack against sometimes even stationary ships. It's ridiculous how ineffective torpedo uh, dive or regular bombers are. Which actually may be more historically accurate than I'd like to think, but, you know, it doesn't make the game fun if I have to take three minutes between bombing runs and the bombs get there and then just miss. General Quarters. General Quarters. That means everybody, like, assume your um, positions in the ship, like you're about to take paddle, go into battle, regardless of whether you're on duty or off duty, like... If you're a turret crew, get to the friggin' turret. That kind of thing. Thirty-two... Thirty-three point, uh... That's a lot of destroyers in this. Uh, I may not get my battleship kill. I mean, couldn't guarantee I was gonna get one anyway, but... 
Oh, somebody's following me. Oh, I got three destroyers following me up. Let's give them a hard time. I'm gonna swerve over to the right here. Launch some tarps in this direction. And then just sort of keep going, just in case something crosses over. Unlikely. There'll probably be a destroyer over in this direction try and engage. Hopefully my uh, torpedoes will be reloaded by then. Because torpedoes at close range in this area over here. Battles tend to end in something exploding. Hmm, maybe no one, no one tried going this way. Usually you'd see something by now. Once I get in sight of a battleship or something large... Oh, destroyers. I can't hit them from here or anything. They're bunched together. They are bunched together. That is kind of weird. Why they would do that. What are you steering right for? Destroyers! Gotcha, bitches. This is gonna be great. Oh shit, okay, they got me. What's up? 